All right. Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Katie Freeman. On behalf of Mystery Writers of America, welcome to the 78th Annual Edgar Award Symposium. Today's discussion is with the nominees for Best Short Story. Our moderator today is Angela Kreider Neary, and I'll be introducing her in a minute. You can learn more about the Edgar Awards by following us on social media using the hashtag Edgars2024 and by visiting the websites mysterywriters.org and edgarawards.com. A reminder that the Edgar Awards will be live streamed on our YouTube channel um, on May 1st. And during today's uh, discussion, I'll be posting links to the stories that are being honored today in the chat. Please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box throughout the conversation and we'll get to them towards the end of the hour. And now to introduce our moderator. Angela Kreider Neary is an attorney by day and writer by night, weekend, and any other time she can fit in. She is an avid mystery reader and especially enjoys reading stories set in interesting locales. She was inspired by one of her favorite areas in San Francisco, Telegraph Hill, to write her first mystery series, Lil Tom and the Pussyfoot Detective Bureau, about a cat detective who fancies himself to be the Sam Spade of cats, solving crimes in the urban animal kingdom. She writes people mystery too, and they are usually short stories that have appeared in Ellery Crean Mystery Magazine, the Boucher Khan Anthology, and Down and Out Books. Angela is a native Texan who relocated to the California Bay Area in 2008. Aside from reading and writing, she enjoys cooking, live music, amateur gardening, and of course, wine tasting. She currently lives in wine country with her husband and their extremely spoiled cat. And mm -hmm. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. So glad you can all be here today. Angela, please take it away. Thank you, Katie, and hello, everyone. Thanks, everybody, our viewers and our panelists, for joining us today for the Edgar Award Symposium for Best Short Story. I'm extremely honored to be moderating this incredibly talented panel. I want to give a special thanks to my fellow short story committee members, Sharon Cook, Robert Goldsboro, Dean James, and Mary Stanton, with whom I went on an incredible journey throughout the last year to read and reread close to 400 amazing short stories. Uh, we'll be spending the next hour chatting with and getting to know the exceptional writers whose unforgettable and entertaining stories rose to the top of the pack. It's been said that the short story is a craft that needs time and skill to perfect. And these writers have proven over their impressive careers that they know how to take that time and have that skill. Congratulations to all of you, our panelists, on your nominations, and welcome. Um, so before we get started on the discussion, I want to briefly introduce our audience to our panelists. Uh, Linda Castillo is the author of the New York Times and USA Today best-selling Kate Burkholder series, set in the world of the Amish. The first book, Sworn to Silence, was adapted into a Lifetime original movie titled An Amish Murder starring Nev Campbell as Kate Burkholder. Castillo is the, rep is the recipient of numerous industry awards, including a nomination by the International Thriller Writers for Best Hardcover, the Mystery Writers of America's Sue Grafton Memorial Award, and an appearance on the Boston Globe shortlist for Best Crime Novel. She lives in Texas with her husband and is currently at work on her next book. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Angela. Next, we have Heather Graham, who is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of over 200 novels, novellas, and short stories, including suspense, paranormal, historical, horror, mainstream, and Christmas family fair. She's the CEO of Slush Pile Production, a recording slash production company for various charity events, and has been honored with the Romance Writers of America's Lifetime Achievement Award, Award Strand Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Award, Thriller Writer's Silver Bullet, and the prestigious Thriller Master Award. In 2024, she'll be a special guest at BoucherCon World Mystery Convention and the World Fantasy Convention, honored as a legend of Nikon, and granted the author of distinction at the Southwest Florida Reading Festival. Heather is the mother of five and considers family and friends to be our greatest gifts in life. She's grateful every day to be writing for a living. You can look her up at the original heathergram.com. Hi, Heather. Hi, thank you so much. Next, we have Rob Osler, 
who writes traditional mysteries featuring LGBTQ plus main characters. His debut novel, Devil's Chew Toy, the predecessor to Cirque du Soleil, was a finalist for the 2023 Anthony McCavity Agatha and Lefty Awards. His short story, Misdirection, from Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, is a finalist for this award, the 2024 Edgar. His first ever publication, Analog, also from e uh, Ellery Queen, won the 2022 Robert L. Fish Award at the Edgars. Great to see you, Rob. I'm shocked to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Rankin is an award-winning, best-selling crime writer, best known for his Inspector Rebus novel. He is a winner of the Edgar Award, the Crime Writers of America Silver Dagger Award, and the Raymond Chandler Fulbright Fellowship, among others. He lives in Edinburgh, Scotland, with his partner and two sons. Hi, and welcome, Ian. Thank you for having me. And finally, we have Lisa Scottolini, who is a number one best-selling and Edgar Award-winning author of 36 novels, including her most recent, The Truth About the Devlins. She also has written a nine-book collection of non-fiction humor books with her daughter, novelist Francesca Saritella. Welcome, Lisa. Angela, I'm honored to be here with this group, I must tell you. So glad to have you all. And after reading these bios, I can tell our viewers that they can't do justice to these amazing authors and all of their accomplishments. So if there are any new fans and readers out there, I would um, encourage you to hurry out and stalk them online. You can find so much about them and their works. So to get us started, um, in the spirit of this Edgar Awards category, I wanted to start by asking each of you to tell our viewers about your nominated story. So Linda, your nominated story, Hallowed Ground, features Chief of Police Kate Burkholder, who's the main character in your series of novels, as well as several of your short stories. So can you tell us a little about your story and the origin of it? Sure. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that this series actually has 16 books now. Uh, I still feel like a newbie. And uh, uh, so uh, normally I do a short story with this series uh, between uh, novels uh, and the short story is usually re released right before the uh, novel comes out, uh, usually in July. And Hallowed Ground was an absolutely uh, a blast to write. Um, if you've read any of the Kate Burkholder books, you know that you know um, uh, they're really not a not a mis uh, not a, a cozy mystery. They're more uh, there's there a lot of intensity. Usually, it begins with a murder. Sometimes the murders tend to be kind of grisly, and there's sort of a juxtaposition between the um, bucolic Amish setting and uh, then the, the introduction of this uh, evil into the into the story. And the short stories tend to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more fun. And uh, Hallowed Ground uh, basically begins with a dog uh, bringing home a bone. And Kate Burkholder and her soon-to-be husband, John Tomasetti, have to figure out uh, where did it come from. Great. Thank you so much. Next, I'll turn to Heather. Your nominated story is part of a music and murder anthology inspired by the songs from Michael Jackson's Thriller album. And your story is titled Thriller from the title track of the album. So tell us a little bit about your story and what what about the title Thriller inspired you to write it? Um, <clears throat> I think we can take Thriller in many different ways. <laughs> so um, in this, uh, something happens to somebody that they're entirely not expecting. And a great deal of it has to do with a dog named Rocket. And I also have a dog named Rocket. <laughs> so ah. he's kind of the, uh, the, the star of the story. I love doing thriller and I absolutely love doing short stories because it makes you think, you know, it takes your mind out of, um, cause I, I do a series called the crew of hunters. That is probably the most popular thing I've done. And there, I love doing it, but it's fun. It's so much fun for somebody to other things that we've done, like with thriller, 
Um, one time it was birds and I had a condor, but somebody else had a firebird. You can take things in so many different directions. Um, so I absolutely love doing this. It's about a heroine who thinks she's doing one thing and finds out that it's quite another. When she's dog sitting, she gets to find out just who the real dogs are. <laughs> so it was, it was a great deal of fun to do. I like that. Well, thank you. So Rob, tell us a little bit about your nominated story, Misdirection, and what inspired you to write that? Uh, the first, well, my, my favorite color is Periwinkle. Uh, and I like the name Periwinkle just as a color. And then I thought, actually, that's a great character name. So the story stars Periwinkle. And um, I spent a lot of time where I'm at now in Palm Springs. And we pass a lot of these little apartment complexes or think think like a really tiny motel, you know, where it's just door, 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 door. And I was like, wow. So what if Periwinkle lived there and a murder occurs there because you have such a tight knit community? Basically, everybody's living on top of each other. So um, and and Perry Perry doesn't do labels. The story starts out, you know, my 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 pronouns are him, her, he, she, potato, potato. Um, he he's a cross dresser and he just doesn't do labels, even though he identifies as a man. He's it's, he's a very complicated character in that respect. But basically, he's going out for his morning power walk in his kids and stumbles across a freckled leg in the in the community room when he's setting up for the uh, for the for the bridge night. And so then the story evolves from there because he has to solve the crime of the woman who turns out to be an ex burlesque dancer named Miss Direction. All right, thank you, Rob. I love those characters. <laughs> um, next I'll turn to Ian. Can you tell us about your nominated short story, The Rise and the catalyst for you writing it? Uh, the catalyst for writing it was that Amazon got in touch and said that they were doing this series of stories that could be read or listened to in one sitting. So perfect for a commute or, or in a car journey or something like that. And it had an idea that was bugging me at the back of my head, um, set in London. Most of my stuff is set in Edinburgh, where I live. This was a chance for me to spread my wings a bit. In London, central London, um, there are a lot of new high-rise apartment blocks, very expensive, very tony apartments that are not lived in. They are a way of um, hiding money away, of keeping money safe. So they're owned by people from overseas. They're owned by oligarchs and um, Arabian princes and government officials from China and you name it. And these apartment blocks sit there in central London, some of the most expensive real estate in the world. The lights are on, but nobody's home. The only person you will see there of an evening will be the security guy. So you've got this kind of poorly paid security person who's there inside the front door manning a desk, and that's it. The rest of the building is empty. And I just thought, what if he's found dead? What if a security guard um, is found murdered inside this very high security, high status apartment block? The police suddenly intrude on the lives of the rich and famous and people who want to remain anonymous. Um, and it was a challenge because they'd said to me, it can be anything up to about 15,000 words. And it's about 15,000 words. I, uh, when I, I got a real surprise when I was shortlisted for this award because I thought it's too long. Um, to my mind, this is a novella rather than a short story. I do write short stories, but they tend to be, you know, 3,000 words. And this one was in, mm. in jeopardy of raging out of control and becoming a full-length novel. And I had to kind of pull myself in and say, no, Ian, you've been paid for a short story. Give him a short story. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much. Um, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about your nominated story, Pigeon Tony's Last Stand, and what inspired it? What brought you into the world of Pigeon Tony and his friend, the Tony? Well, <laughs> it sounds so absurd, and maybe it is, but I, I, I've written the Rosado and Denunzio series, which is a series about an all-woman law firm. I think there's 17 in all of those books. And you know, all those of us who write and those of us who love to read too, you know, there's always minor characters in novels and they sometimes I love, they stay with you. 
And so in the Rosado series, the Tonys, it's three men all named Tony. It's, it's, you know, I love listening to everyone on the panel because it's so clear how setting plays into their short stories. And it's true of me as well. South Philly is the Italian American enclave. I started life there. So it's actually not that atypical to have everybody named Tony. And I grew up with that. So I have a like a Greek only Italian chorus of the Tonys. And I thought Amazon asked me and I thought, you know, I want to write about them. And in a way, it's interesting because listening to Linda sort of saying, uh, she goes, I went a little darker because these characters in the novels function almost as a comic relief. And I like that because I think those of us who write crime fiction, you know, there's dark parts and I like humor and I like to goof around. And I think characters do use that. So here we have three characters that we usually see in a more jokey context. They're all octogenarians. They're also overlooked in that way. They're all named Tonys, they're all pals, but what happens in their little South Philadelphia block is some drug dealers start to zero in and try to uh, co-opt a young boy who's in middle school. And I sort of wanted to look at the large, not only is it, I think it's fun and I think it's entertaining, but it also is looking at the larger issue of how does crime impact a family? How does it impact a community? Really get it small, because that's what I had the Ian problem. I can't say hello in 30 words. So I'm like, Lisa, rein it in, bring it down, calm yourself and try to be narrow. And that was the task and I hope I did it. But I was shocked to not be nominated, delighted to be nominated. Oh, yes, great. Thank you so much. And you kind of set, set us up for a, a great line of questioning that I wanted to bring up about the importance of setting in a book and how you use it in your books and stories. Um, and so Lisa, did you wanna say anything more about like the inspiration for using Philly as a, as a setting? Well, Philly is good because it has this great idea that at least in the US, US law was born here and the constitution <clears throat> was formed here. But what I'm struck by is the similarities when like Ian's talking about the apartment building. You know, in, in South Philly, everybody is on top of each other and everybody knows everybody else. So you really, you really get a lot of interplay about the impact of crime and what the community does to save itself to the extent that it can. Um, so that's really yeah. all I'd say with regard to that. Okay, yes, thank you, I like that. Um, and Ian, that's very interesting what you said about London and the, the unused apartment complexes. Um, but as you said, you usually use Edinburgh as a backdrop. And I've, I've enjoyed hearing over the years what you've said about it. You said it is the city that sums up, sums up the human condition and that you like to find the spaces in the city where Hyde and Jekyll meet. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about Edinburgh as a setting for your Rebus series? Well, I mean, everywhere in the world has light and dark, has good and evil, has bits of town that you want to avoid and bits of town where terrible things are happening and bits of town where people can live their whole lives without realizing there's crime happening just around the corner. But Edinburgh has it structurally and philosophically. Um, we have, it's two cities. There's the old town and the new town. The old town existed up until the mid to late 18th century. And everybody was crammed into this small space. It got very unsanitary, it got overcrowded. Um, and so the wealthy people decided to build a new town just to the north of the old town. And there was a physical barrier between the two. There was a loch, a lake, which has now been drained and is Princess Street Gardens. So they started building this, this other city and it was built to a rational design. So if you look at a map, a plan, a street plan of Edinburgh, you will see this very planned, very rational grid layout like an American city to the north and then to the south, higgledy-piggledy, just chaos. So you've got the kind of chaotic and the plan, the rational and the irrational in one city. And Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Jekyll and Hyde, a great Edinburgh writer, he grew up in the new town. He grew up in a rational a family of lawyers and scientists and um, engineers. But he was attracted to the darker side. He was attracted to the old town, which was filled with vagabonds and, and prostitutes and layabouts and drunks. So he moved between the two. And, um, and he decided with Jekyll and Hyde that he would write about the fact that human beings can be like that as well. That on the surface, everything's okay. You're controlled, you're rational, you're enlightened. But underneath there are these very base instincts that are just dying to emerge. And if you don't hold them in check, they will emerge. So Edinburgh for me is just a fascinating city to write crime fiction in. 
But London's the same. London's got on the outskirts, the periphery. You've got very, you've got terrible housing um, projects. You've got people, kids being used to to, to run drugs um, and carry guns and stuff because they can't be prosecuted the way that the adults can. Uh, you've got race issues. You've got people carrying knives for their own protection. Um, and then you, as a visitor, you arrive, you go, this is lovely, Buckingham Palace. And there's the changing of the guards and beef eaters and tradition and stuff. And just below, when you scratch the surface of these of this big high rise apartment block, when you scratch the surface, you find that a lot of ugly stuff is just hiding below the surface. So there's no to me, there's not much difference between what happens in a big American city, what happens in London and also what happens to a lesser extent in a small city like Edinburgh. Right. OK, thank you so much. Um... Linda, what originally brought you into the world of Amish and inspired you to write in that setting, which is a setting, but also a culture, as you've mentioned? You know, it really is. I, I'm originally from Ohio. I live in Texas now. And, uh, you know, I was aware of the Amish uh, when, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a kid growing up. And, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier that, you know, if you look at a setting like that in terms of writing crime fiction, there really is uh, a juxtaposition. Uh, you know, uh, the Kate Brooke Holder books are set in, in Holmes County, Ohio, and, you know, it's a very tourist area, uh, a lot of uh, farms, and it's just absolutely beautiful. It's peaceful. And I was very intrigued by the introduction of something evil, uh, usually um, a murder into that kind of setting. And uh, another thing that I love, uh, the, the book is set in the fictional town of Painters Mill, Ohio. And uh, it's a very small town, population uh, 5,300, and a third of those are Amish. And it really gives me the opportunity to sort of, you know, explore the whole, uh, Amish culture. And I think that's particularly true because Kate Burkholder was born Amish. And so we're able to, you know, the reader can sort of catch a glimpse of it through her eyes and know what it's like to, to be Amish. She's sort of an outsider to the Amish now because she left, but because of her being formerly Amish, she's also, you know, an outsider to uh, the English, so to speak. And right. I think the one place that she really fits in is with her uh, small police department. And there are some quirky characters uh, that, that are absolutely a joy to write. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Heather, I believe your, your story thriller was set in a, in an area of Miami. <laughs> was there anything that in, in particular inspired you to set your story there? Uh, yeah, when I was growing up, Coconut Grove is an area that uh, it had some of the hottest clubs, but it also had million dollar mansions next to crack houses. And it's uh, the, the foliage there is absolutely beautiful. Um, so it, and it can be very dark if you're in the wrong place at night. It can be very dangerous. Um, Miami is actually kind of <laughs> its own place entirely because we are so diversified, very heavily Hispanic. And it's just, it's a, a we're, we're our own thing. Um, I do tend to love places in general. Ian, my dad was born in Stirling. So I love going back to Scotland. And um, I, I married an Italian who has 200 relatives. And wait a minute, at least five of them are Tony, Anthony. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, and. <Anne>. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do love, I love New Orleans to use. I love Miami. When I was a little kid, they kept finding bodies in barrels, which I've definitely used in the Everglades. The Everglades is fascinating. Um, mm. But uh, we, I've uh, covered my bases. I belong to HWA. I, I mean, almost everything out there. And um, I love HWA. We took a night at the Lizzie Borden house every year. And um, oh. <laughs> One time it turned out biography was filming and they thought we were their actors. So my daughter got to hack me to death at the Lizzie Borden house. So that was definitely. Oh, that's great. And I got to throw blood on her and the people in the streets are at the window and they screamed and ran away. They will believe for the rest of their lives they saw Lizzie Borden. But that's, I, I don't think you can go anywhere. Um, I, I use Sterling and Edinburgh a lot too, just because my dad 
and I use Dublin because of my mom. And um, I love places. I just love them. I love New Orleans. It's one of the creepiest, most atmospheric places you'll ever go. And um, I don't know. I think places give so much to it. Places in history. I love history too. And like I said, Coconut Grove. It's uh, you know, we like to think we're safe in Miami. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you really don't want to be alone on certain streets at night. Right. I agree. Um, and last but not least, Rob, Palm Springs is the setting for your story misdirection. And I love the mysterious, seductive glamour of the desert oasis out there. What led you to use that as a backdrop? Well, um, as I was saying before, we we live here part time uh, and it's 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 a you know, I mean, there's the warmth and people will wander around, at least in, in Perry's community, you know, in their bathrobes. Um, uh, but but more than anything, I'm going to kind of come at this a different way, like go back to Ian's comment about like 15,000 words. Misdirection is about 5,000, I think, somewhere in there. It's, it's very short. And it's a classic whodunit. And so the setting of that little uh, retirement community that Perry lives in really works well for the whodunit because he knows all the neighbors so he knows all the suspects and he's got a very short window of time page count or word count to solve the mystery so it, it actually works out being very efficient that it all happens within the gates of this very small community because you know it's 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 one of five people you know and they're all his neighbors you know and it could be the property manager but again he he knows everybody so Again, just it's 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 a good device that it's it's happened in the neighborhood, and it's not a it's not a locked room mystery per se, but uh, the the suspects are very limited, the page counts limited, the word counts limited, and it's it's really efficient for him to go about uh, his sleuthing, which is very amateur, by the way, um, in in that in that setting, which is called yucca palms, which he then notes is like insane because everybody knows that yucca is, you know, not not a not a yucca. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, speaking of, um, I'll I'll ask you uh, to start our next um, topic, Rob. You have a gift for including wit and humor in your writing. Um, so, do you have any advice about incorporating humor into a story? The pros and cons, when to use it, when not to use it. Since we are often talking about murder here. Yeah. Wow, that's such a hard question. It's like. What, I, what I've said before on panels, because I never, I don't really think of myself as a funny person. I'm not the person, you know, like out with friends at dinner, who's going to keep everybody laughing. But I, I think my trick, at least for me, is to create funny characters. And through them, honestly, it, this is truthful. It's like they end up saying funnier things than I could, that I could come up with as Rob. But as Perry Winkle, he can do ridiculous things and say ridiculous things and get away with it. And so I think I think my my my, my suggestion is you know write big characters. Probably everybody here is old enough to remember the mockumentary um Spinal Tap. Do you remember that mockumentary Spinal Tap? And and um the the guitarist he's he's dealing with the amp and he's like and he's British so forgive me but he's he's like you turn it up to 11 because it's louder at 11. And I just, I love that. So for me, I, I dial the, my, the, the main characters that I want to be humorous. I think of them as dialing them up to 11, right? So it's like 12, 13, they're just going to be so ridiculous that you can't relate to them, but I'll push it at like at 11. So Perry Winkle is, is my 11, if you will. I don't I know love if there's that. Some advice of... in there at all, but that's, that's what I approach it. That's okay. Somebody quoted that exact scene to me last week, I think, about it only goes to 10, but if you turn it up to 11, it's better. So <laughs> um, anyone else, please, um, I won't call on you. Just please feel free to jump in about, do you use humor? Do you like to read humor? Not at all. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, especially when you're writing uh, darker stories, um, I think sometimes it's good to let the reader come up for a, a breath of air. And, um, you know, I don't write funny and, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a funny person, but sometimes I think characters are so quirky. 
And we've all known people like this in our lifetimes that they're funny when they don't even mean to be funny. They're just funny because of what kind of character they are and the things that they say. And I have a blast when I'm able to inject that into a story. Yeah, I think I would add to that too, that in my case, I like, I, I think that another thing that humor does, first, let's be real. I want to write in entertaining. Whatever it is, it has to be entertaining. And if you can make the reader laugh, they come away like this, like this. And you, you kind of want that. Um, I also think, at least in my story, it's about these older men who have been friends forever. And they all have pasts. And some of their pasts are very dark. Pigeon Tony is an Italian immigrant. The book set a little while ago. And he lived through fascism. So here he is um, in, mo in modern day Philadelphia. His relationship to the police is very ambivalent because he's afraid of authority because he knows the abuses of authority. So the darkness with him is leavened by the humor, but the humor that these three men share is part, it, it, it sh the humor shows the relationship as all of us, you know, we have best friends, we have friends forever. I'm old enough to have friends that are 30 and 40 years old. Um, we can make jokes all the time and it shows our intimacy. And I wanted that too. So it's the humor that binds them. It's kind of nice to write about a little grouping like that, especially with older people whose, whose genuine wit, whose perspective on life uh, is often overlooked. Like how many times, I'm like, Lisa, you're gonna write a short story with like, you know, three 80 year old men in the lead. Is, is that a good idea? <laughs> and uh, you know, they're not shiny and new, but they're real. And that warmth that they have between themselves, I think, really does carry the story. I think that humor is a part of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I tend to write police procedurals. And there was a time when I was younger when I was hanging out with a lot of cops and they were introducing me to other professionals. And people that work in very stressful situations like that do have an extraordinary sense of humor. They need a sense of humor to survive the day job. If you're a paramedic, if you're a lawyer, if you're a social worker, if you work in a mortuary or you do autopsies for a living, um, if you're a cop, um, the kind of dark humor that you get from those jobs is a way of actually uh, of decompressing. And so when although my books are fairly se very serious, I guess there are just little moments, little tiny beats throughout the, the book that are provided by these people in these very high pressure jobs. Who are using humor as a way to avoid talking about the horror or as a way of dealing with the horror that is part and parcel of their everyday experience. I was about to say the same thing. I have friends who do autopsies and it's it's the same thing to get through jobs that are that difficult. Um, one of my second son's best friends is a arson homicide investigator and he says the same thing, you know, that they have that dark sense of humor. And, you know, sometimes if you're going to stay sane and do that kind of work, you have to keep a sense of humor going. Very true. Well, oh, I also had a really bad occasion once that turned out to be good. I had gone to the funeral of a friend whose dad had died and I forgot to turn off my phone. And my ringtone was don't fear the reaper. Um, I was horrified <laughs> and they told me it was the first time they laughed. So, you know, you, you just never know, you know, little bits of, of things like that can, you know, lighten things for somebody at some time. And definitely, again, we're trying to entertain people. So, you know, definitely if we can throw some humor in and natural humor, you know, that comes out of the characters of the situation, I think, you know, I, I don't think I'm known for being especially hysterical either, but <laughs> try to give characters some sometimes. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, so Ian kind of touched on this speaking uh, about his longer short story. And writing a short story is a special skill set because you often want to focus on just one or two small things rather than a lot of subplots and backstories as you might for a novel. So how do each of you approach that when you write a short story? And what have you done to develop that skill? Any rules or parameters for writing a short story? I was praying so much because I don't do it a lot. I've done smaller short stories for charity. I can't remember the word count, but I thought it was kind of long. 
And a little bit now, so I just felt like you have to tell, um, it, it reminded me a little bit of novel writing in this, and maybe this is helpful advice for people, because I, I really want to encourage people. I think all of us, I think everybody has a book in them, and I hope they write it. Um, in a novel, you, I always think to myself, well, Hemingway said, write drunk, edit sober. Now, obviously, I don't do that, but get the idea is the same. Get it all down, then trim it up. So what I did with this short story was I wrote down what I wanted to write. And then I was like, okay, well, this is obviously not short anymore, Lisa. You need to shut up a little. And so I went and trimmed it, trimmed it, trimmed it, trimmed it. So in a way, the technique was the same. I couldn't approach it from the outset, write smaller, because it was a, it was a discrete problem. I think what ends up happening a little bit is a technical matter is you don't have a lot of subplots. You don't have time for a subplot. You have just like a main top line story and you get to the point, which is difficult for me, but I managed to. <laughs> yeah, I think my short story, uh, Hallowed Ground was relatively long. I don't remember the exact word count, but it was between 10 and 15,000. Uh, and my editor, a lovely editor, uh, gave me some really good advice when I wrote my first short story get get to the point which is exactly what uh lisa just said and uh you know the, it's it's fast pacing it's like your character jumps into a fast moving river and you just keep going and keep that pacing fast you can always fill in during your uh your sober editing time <laughs> yeah i mean i love I, short stories oh sorry you get no, no, go go ahead Oh, yeah. no I was, the very first thing I, I ever sold was a short horror story to Twilight Zone. And I, I made a big $15 on it. And with five children, that didn't go real far. So um, I found out you could do a whole lot better with books. But I, I still love short stories. And especially because um, I have been doing a series for a long time. I have a tendency to do for the, uh, I do a lot of books. So for the the hardcover each year with uh, HarperCollins, I've been doing a couple that are like either two to four books in length and, and kind of like a each standalone, but basically series. And again, I think it's so much fun for someone to give you the challenge um, of coming up with something. And I think, I think all of us did a lot of them, especially during the pandemic for charities. And it, I think it is its own thing and that we've, you know, really summed it up well with it's get to the point. You have less space. You have less time. You have to develop characters very quickly, situations very quickly. And then in a shorter format, it's like anything else. It has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> so it's just, you know, kind of learning. But I also got into that thing where you think a short story is going to be approximately anywhere from three to 10,000. A novella is going to be anything from 15 to 35. And then a novel can be anything probably from 50 on up. Um, but uh, it, you, I think it's just, you sit down to think a little bit differently. Yeah, I was going to say just, you know, I, I just try to keep it as tight as I can, right? So if there's a murder, happens soon. Suspects, they happen soon. I tend to write comedic and they're a little over the top. So a little goes a long way. And so it's just very, very compressed. And and I tend to do, you know, like a who done it. So, you know, it's just got to be, it's just got to be very snappy. And I, I know I'm repeating what what others have already said, but you know, get to the point and just keep it very tight. At least, right, like, there's no, there's no backstory. You just, you just gotta, you gotta get going, go quick, and then resolve it. And Ian, you said your your nominated story is a bit long, but you have most of your short stories are shorter. So. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer the shorter versions generally? Well, usually a short story is just one little twist of an idea that you get and you think, well, I can do that in a day. That's going to be fantastic. You've In a day, you've managed to do something that's never existed before. There's a nice sense of achievement at the end of it. Whereas when you start writing a novel, it can become quite grueling because it's just day after day after day after day. When I was young and full of vim and vigor, I was writing, you know, a short, I was getting ideas for short stories too many. And I was just churning them out. I was writing them and writing them and writing them, all these great ideas. I thought, I'm never going to live long enough to write these up as novels. So I might as well condense them and do them as short stories. 
And there used to be lots of wonderful outlets for short stories um, in the UK and the US and elsewhere. Um, and before I was known as a novelist, I was writing short stories and getting some success by either getting them on BBC radio or winning prizes for them. In America, um, Ellery Queen was superb, taking early stories from me and just giving you that little bit of confidence as a young writer. Um, not much money, but a little bit of confidence that there's someone out there who appreciates what you're doing and wants to publish you. And so the short stories were a part of the apprenticeship for me. It was part of getting to know how to structure a piece of work, how to create character, as everybody said, how to get in, get in quick, have a, an amazing opening, an amazing first line so that everybody's going to stay with you, a little twist at the end that nobody sees coming, um, but do it in a very contained way. And I, I used to, you know, I've, I don't write many short stories now. I don't, uh, I, I don't get as many ideas. I'm getting old now. I'm getting old. I'm past it. I'm semi-retired. And if I get one or two good ideas a year, I'm happy. Um, and as I say, this when Amazon said, have you got anything that might make an interest in long form short story? This was an idea that I'd had, but I thought, well, I, I'm not going to get a publisher interested in it because it's not set in Scotland. I'm known now in the UK as someone who writes about Scotland. So for me to start stepping on everybody's toes and write a story set in London, I thought maybe, uh, maybe not so much, a novel set in London. But the short story worked really well. Um, and, and, I, and I grew to really like the main character, the detective in that story, Gish, to the extent that I'm thinking I might write about her again. I mean, people who've read the story okay. and say, you know, she's a great character. Maybe you can do more with her. And thankfully, top tip, she wasn't dead at the end. Sorry if that's a spoiler, but it means I can bring her back and maybe develop her later on. I look forward to that. Um, well, several of you have touched a little bit on advice to new, maybe new readers, um, I'm sorry, writers, um, and also about um, forums. So I kind of want to combine those. So what, generally, what's the best and worst advice you've been given along the way? What advice would you give to new writers? And maybe even like, what, where can people submit their short stories, for example, that to get things started for them? I, I want to jump in on the hopefully good advice because it came from my mother and it was be yourself. And I do think there's an aspect, I was particularly in the short story, when I looked at this one again, I was like, well, this is so voicey. You know, it's such a story that is told in someone's voice. He's so uniquely an Italian immigrant. He's so uniquely South Philly, a man of a certain age. And that that's okay to do. Like that's, if that's what comes out of you, you should just be yourself about it. The great thing I think, there's so many great things about this job. But one is that the real, in my opinion, there are no rules. So I guess the bad advice is anyone who tells you there are rules, but if you really just write the story you wanna tell or the novel you wanna tell, you're just a human being like all of us and somebody else will probably love it if you love it. And it's really as simple and really as loving as that. I really wanna invite people to take that to heart because I think if there's one thing that it carries me through and I have insecurities. I sit there every day go, uh, uh, can I do this? I go, just tell it, let yourself tell the story and get out of your own way. Great. I suggest groups. Um, I think I've gotten carried away with it. I belong to just about everything. But I love my groups. Fiction writers tend to be the nicest people in the world. They love to help each other. And there are all kinds of conferences. And then the only thing I say about a conference is I like the subject that, no, there are no rules. Listen, you know, to what people have to advise and then take and use what works for you. And the other thing is, if you really want to do it, be disciplined. If you have a busy, busy life and it's one day a week, make sure you're disciplined and, and work on that one day a week. If whatever it is that you give yourself do, remember life happens. And if something does happen, you get back on the bike and start over again. Um, and uh, believe in yourself and be excited about what you're doing. And like I said, again, I've never, again, I belong to all of them. <laughs> I've never met more giving helpful people than writers. And um, I heard somebody say one time, well, why do you want to train your competition? And it's kind of like, well, what would we read if other people weren't writing? You know, you've got to have that. So um, I really do suggest if you're anywhere near a group, MWA, all kinds of groups are out there. So uh, look look up something like that. And then again, 
if you say you're going to do it, do it. Uh, I just want to jump in. Lisa and Heather, the best, best advice ever. I agree with every word uh, that both of you uh, just said uh, early on, you know, and this is writing in general. You know, I was told you're doing it wrong. Um, uh, I think go ahead and break the rules. I think the one thing that we should keep in mind you know, is reader expectations. Uh, you know, I, I think it's 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 good to veer away from rules sometimes. Sometimes that adds a whole new freshness that, you know, uh, or, or fresh perspective. And so um, just want to reiterate uh, what you guys just said. I would give a shout out to Ellery Queen uh, and their Department of First Stories, because in every issue, and it, it, it comes out six times a year, um, they dedicate two story spots to unpublished authors. So it's their first it's their first shot. And that was the first thing I ever had published was uh, analog in in Ellery Queen. So a huge shout out to Jackie Skirbo and and uh, Janet Hutchins at Ellery Queen for continuing that. So that's that's a great place to aim your your uh, short story if you're uh, if you haven't been published yet. And Ian, any advice from you? Um, I mean, it's difficult because I grew up in an analog time. I grew up in a time of traditional publishing and print magazines and all the rest of it. I mean, now there are all these different avenues open to, to new writers, the Internet. Um, th there are all kinds of ways you can you can put your material on the Internet and somebody somewhere might want to read it and they might like it. And suddenly before you know it, you're getting a fan base and you're getting a little bit more confidence writers groups whether it's online or in person your local library might know if it's a local writers group if it doesn't exist there might be one online or you can start one up just getting that little bit of feedback feeling that you're not alone in the world thinking that you're not the only person going through this process um and keep writing i mean just scribble i mean you know i was writing for years before it was published and you've just got to be prepared to not be published for quite a while um, and hopefully while that's happening, you're getting a little bit more stubborn and you're improving and you're reading a lot. So you're improving because you're reading what other people are writing. But mostly it's stubbornness, I think. Mostly it's just saying, look, thinking to yourself, I've got something worth saying. And, and eventually, if I keep at this, somebody will realize I've got something worth saying and they will come to the table and want to read it. So, you know, don't give up. Great Agreed. advice from all of you. Okay, well, it looks like we have um, a few questions from our viewers that I'll try to get to some of those. So for those of you ha who had the Amazon original stories, do you know if those will ever be published in a print version or if they might turn into a book of some sort? I, I think they're an ebook. I, I count that, I'm delighted. I, I don't think they're gonna be published in a book, in, a, in, a, in paper. Right. I, I, think, I think I think my contract said that Amazon had the exclusive right, so it'll be ebook and audio for for a few years, audio. and then at some point in the future, um, I will get those rights back, and it can be published in physical form. Um, so I think it was I can't remember if it was three, four, five years. So at some point down the line, I would love to see it as a physical, maybe a a story in a collection of stories. Okay. Um, I like this one. This I like the idea of the twists, especially for short stories. Um, so do you know your short story's major twist when you begin, or does it occur to you as you write? And do you have to have a twist? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll answer this. It's like, we've all gotten this question, you know, are you a plotter? Or are you a pantser? I think, I think, I'm stunned those people who can like write a full length novel, you know, like a good whodunit as a, as a pantser, you know, fly by the seat of your pants. Cause it's like, wow, how do you do that? You're more genius than I, I think for a short story, it's super hard to just kind of like, I'm just going to start tap, tap, tapping and see where this thing goes. Cause your runway is so short. So for me, I have to know, I have to know, you know, who, who the, who the villain is, who the victim is, how it got done. And what, what is that twist at the end? I'm a pantser. <laughs> so when I when you said I'm shocked people, I was like, yeah, he's gonna be like me. So it's a total opposite. But yeah, and, and, and I think it reiterates again, you know, whatever you feel more, 
uh, I admire people who do an outline before, whether a short story or a longer form. But for me, I think it would feel like Mad Libs. I don't want to know. It also makes me hard to live with. Like I'm divorced twice, you know, because I'm like, I'm always, you know, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? I don't know. Next time I sit down, like Ian said, you know, you every day after day, you got to figure out what's happening next. But I don't know anything in advance ever. So did you did you know like how how that how are you gonna wrap that up? I've read all your stories by the way. I love no, them. I didn't. no, really, that's incredible. I'm clueless. I'm clueless, man. You impressed? <laughs> Get me out of this, Ian. <laughs> Linda, what what do you think? You know, um, usually I have sort of a vague roadmap, especially on short stories, because you know you do you you are very limited in the amount of space, and you want your pacing to be really tight. It's always a beautiful moment when you sort of have that vague roadmap and then something spontaneous happens and you're like, yeah, that's it. That's, you know, so, that's happened to me a lot. Uh, I, I actually have a better idea than what, you know, because I am, I'm a plotter, um, you know, being a pantser, that's, you know, would be wonderful, but I have to plot in advance. But it's always a, a great moment when, you know, you're writing and you're like, no, this is what has to happen. So. Well, going back to my beginning, I found out um, and began again, uh, like in traditional, um, I found out that they would, when you had contracts, a lot of the time they would pay you for a synopsis. Um, therefore, I learned to come up with a synopsis. And then I found I liked it because you always had somewhere to go. You might change it, but you always had a concept of something. But I think one of the things when you're talking about the pantsers, like one time I had an idea it was actually for one of the ITW anthologies. And when I got to the end, I thought of something else. And I almost wanted to do a choose your own adventure, but I thought the editor would kill me. <laughs> so I decided I better not. But you do find out as you're doing something that something that you hadn't originally thought of could work a whole lot better. But then again, if you do a synopsis or something and it changes, people don't usually want to beat you up for it as long as, you know, as long as it's, you know, coming out okay. <laughs> so, um, but but I think both are totally legitimate. I have friends who work in, you know, both ways. And Ian, are you a plotter, pantser? Do you know about twists ahead of time? Uh, I'm, I'm both. I am both. Um, I mean, in this short story, I think I pretty much knew everything that was going to happen before I put pen to paper, as it were. Um, in my novels, I never know what's going to happen. And and I'm a great believer in serendipity, that something amazing will turn up if you just trust. The, it's like the novel knows where it wants to go. I just hang on by the seat of my pants while it, it goes off. I mean, I've just finished writing a, a new book, and I was at least halfway through the first draft before I worked out who the killer was. I think I was more than halfway through the first draft. In the past, it's sometimes been the second draft. I've just got these gaps that I leave until I can work it out. So when I start a novel, usually I know as little as my detectives. They appear in the murder scene, and as they are finding out stuff, I'm finding out stuff. And you just hope it takes you in some pretty interesting directions. And usually it goes off on a tangent, and suddenly a minor character becomes a major character, a major character becomes a minor character. The person you thought did it, didn't do it, couldn't have done it. Um, and I, that's, you know, I would, I think I would get bored if I knew what was going to happen in a, a book. I'm going to sit down for months to write this. If I know everything I'm going to do every day, I'd get bored. Short stories are different. Yeah. Short stories, I usually know what's going to happen from the word go because it's such a tight frame. Um, you've not got that freedom, I don't think, that you have when you're a novelist. But again, as people have said, it's, you know, different strokes for different folks. What works for me, I've tried teaching creative writing and I can't do it because I say to people, just make it up. Just sit down and make it up and they go, we're, we're paying thousands of dollars to be on this course. Um, <laughs> I'm saying, just go, let's just go to the pub and, and talk about it <laughs> and go home and just make stuff up. And it might be good and it might not. I want to be in that class. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. Um, we have another question I think we can have time for. Um, an audience member who has published dozens of stories in journals. How do you break into better known journals? And generally for your careers, is it useful to have an agent or what else has worked for you? <sighs> 
that's an that's an age old question that hasn't changed as much as publishing has in the years that I have been in it, because some people say you need the agent to get the publisher, and some people say you need the publisher to get the agent. Um, but then again, uh, a, a lot of times when you go to mystery writers, thriller writers, these things, they have agent and editor speed dating, uh, where you get a chance to talk to people. Um, or even like I said, like Florida has a wonderful MWA group down here by me. And I, I just, I, I love us. Um, but, and, and friends help friends and somebody who's really made their career in short stories would definitely be the best advice on this. Um, but people know when you, the different meetings and things, people know which agent is taking on people now, what publisher is looking for what, um, who's doing, um, anthologies. And uh, I, I can pitch right now for BoucherCon New Orleans if you want. Please feel free to submit stories. Don Bruns will be editing for our book, our anthology for New Orleans. There's all kinds of things like that going on. Mystery writers, thriller writers, everybody is always doing anthologies. And sometimes you get a story in with some of those other people and you're definitely going to be read. So that's not a money maker, but it's not a bad idea. Um, but again, and, and I'm blanking on every one of them. There are a couple of other b besides Ellery Queen out there. And I can't think of who they are right now. Hitchcock is the other Dell. Hitchcock. And then um, I think Suspense Magazine is going to be doing something again. I'm not sure. Um, I think Strand, but, Strand Magazine. I think Strand Magazine is publishing. Strand. Shows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, again, it's this, this, you know, the landscape has changed, but when I was, young and hungry i would go to any mystery convention you know boucher con down any mystery convention i could go to and just look for name badges of people who were editors at publishing houses and magazines and run up to them and say hi you don't know me i'm scottish i write short stories what's your you know how do i send you any how do i send you stuff i think i may well have done that with ellery queen I think I might have run up to Janet Hutchins at Ellery Queen and said, you don't know who I am, but I write about this cop in Edinburgh called Rebus. Can I send you some short stories? And and you might get a rejection letter, but you try again. You might get a nice rejection letter, which gives you a little bit of confidence. And if you don't try with them, you might find somebody else. Yeah, I would just want to throw in and reiterate what people are saying about joining MWA, Mystery Writers, because I think the key thing for writing is it's kind of solitary. It's, in fact, it's completely solitary. And so it's nice to know, particularly, I find it at all levels of my life, but it's nice to know you're not alone. Uh, other people get rejected. Any, All of us can sit around a bar and tell you our best rejection stories, our best signing where nobody shows up stories. <laughs> we all have those stories. And... When you are in a group like Mystery Writers, which to me has been enormous in my life, really convivial group, all my friends are in it. Um, we help each other. Oh, this agent's looking, oh, that. So it's, it's partly professional, but it's partly just for the heart. You're not alone. We love doing this. There's a lot of rejection, but you got to hang tough. Ian really said it back, just never give up. And, and by the way, can I just add, my first novel was never published, and then I lost it. But my point is this, no writing is wasted. If it doesn't see the light of day, except for you or your friends, that's okay too. Because your neck, you're getting better and better and better. And I really, I hope you take that to heart because I find that really true in my life. Thank I you think so much. Also, when, um, I'll try to be quick here. When I had first started writing and I finally, you know, then you had to wait for, you had a self-addressed stamped envelope, um, you know, and, and, the first time I got a phone call, my mother-in-law patted me on the back and said, you know, somebody's probably joking with you. They were at sales meetings, so nobody did call back for two weeks. But when I had the editor, she asked me, oh, do you have anything else? And I said, well, I have a few other things, but they've been rejected. And she said, well, that's OK. I'll see them now. And I, you know, was kind of hesitant about what to say. And I was like, yeah, but they've been rejected by you. And she said, that's OK. You can send them back because sometimes once they've seen something, they're willing to put a little more work into you too, or, you know, I should say work into a product as they want to see it. Uh, a pro I say product story as they want to see it. Oh, one other thing, I think it still exists. Writer's Digest, Writer's Market. Um, that was the very first thing I had. And they list who's taking what, where, and I believe there's also a Writer's Digest agents market. I do believe they're still out there. You just have to be careful that they're the current year uh, because people change. 
Well, thank you and congratulations again to all of you. We might be about to be cut off, but I want to let everyone know to join us on Monday at 5 Pacific for the conversation with the nominees for the Lillian Jackson Braun Memorial Award. And you can find out more by visiting mysterywriters.org and tune into the live broadcast of the Edgar Awards ceremony on May 1st. So we are still here. If anybody has any additional advice or anything they want to say. Just thank you. Yeah. Thank and it's, 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 yeah. Saturday, it's Saturday night here in the